Hello, this is a load management dialogue presented by PLMA. Here you'll discover practitioner perspectives on flexible energy load management, demand resources, sorry, demand response and distributed energy resources. Today's session, which we're very excited about, offers the opportunity to meet with our uh, 20th PLMA award winners, Southern California Edison, and they all are presenting their TOU transition program together with GridX and Oracle Energy and Water. And now it's my pleasure to bring to the floor uh, Rich Phillip, who is the executive director of PLMA, and he will serve as today's moderator. So floor is yours, Rich, and welcome everybody. Here we go. So thank you, Judy. Um, here and it's an honor to uh, to present this present presentation today from our award winner and thought leadership from Southern Cal Edison and their partners at GridX and Oracle. Um, the uh, first, uh, so the uh, take a moment here. So. The uh, Edison is uh, is Eva Molnar. Um, Eva has been responsible for the implementation of the time of use rates and renewable energy rates there in Southern California. Joining Eva in today's um, discussion, who's the chief customer officer for GridX, and Richter, who is the um, say global vice president with uh, with Oracle and working in the O Power space. So you're your speakers for today. Um, I will hand this over now to Eva to uh, to kick us off for level set with Southern Cal Edison. Great, thank you, Rich. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to do is provide an update of who Southern California Edison is. And uh, we cover a very large area in Southern California with over 5 million customers. And it covers a large territory, over a million power poles, 52,000 miles of transmission lines. And our priorities at Southern California Ed Edison are uh, prioritizing our infrastructure investments mo to modernize the grid, um, improving reliability, especially given we've had wildfires in the last few years, and then preparing for a clean energy future. And then we are an uh, investor-owned utility that is regulated by uh, our Utilities Commission. Next slide. So I wanted to set the stage for a discussion uh, with our clean power pathway. So if we want to reduce emissions, we need to move towards 100% renewables by 2045. And there's lots of things that uh, utilities, as well as the state of California, needs to prepare for in order to become 100% renewable. And one of the key components of that is making sure that we have customers participating on time of use rates. The reason for that is that it provides accurate signals to encourage use at the right time, and it matches the uh, price that the customer pays with the cost to serve those customers. So the challenge we have is changing that mindset with our customers to get them thinking not just about how much they use for energy, but also when they're using their energy. So if we go to the next slide, I wanna talk about our transition to, of customers to time of use rates. So the this all was enabled back in 2008 when customers started to uh, move to smart meters. Uh, and it's amazing to think about we're actually, you know, meters usually have about a 20 year lifespan. We're actually already starting to plan our next round of smart meters uh, and, and the deployment of the, the new versions of those. So we're already entering almost our second phase here. Uh, but when we enabled the capability to measure by time of day, there was still really limited uptake of those rate options. Really the main adopters of this were solar customers. So in 2015, the commission made a decision that we should move towards a more uh, proactive approach to getting customers onto time of use rates. So we started with an opt-in pilot in 2016, and then we moved to a default pilot of about 400,000 customers in 2018. And then we had our full rollout of customers, a uh, little shy of 2 million customers moving all the way through June of 2022. 
And in the midst of that, we had to take a 12 month pause for replacement of our billing system. So uh, the, the transition now for time of use is complete. And when customers start service, they are given a rate conversation where they have the option to choose a time of use rate uh, or to choose a, a traditional tiered rate. We have about 60% of our customers today, res customers on a time of use rate and 100% are almost a little shy of 100% of our non-res customers are on time of use rates. Next slide. So one of the keys to making sure that customers are helped through the, the transition to time of use rates is to make sure that we provide a very robust education, um, marketing education outreach campaign around the new rate options. So in order to do that, one of the key components of this was providing customers with a rate analysis so they could understand if they moved to a time of use rate, what would they be paying versus uh, versus what they're currently, the rate that they're currently on. So the rate analysis displays historical usage over the last 12 months with the current prices, and it shows how their rate would be impacted by, or how their bill would be impacted by moving to the new rate. And it helps customers understand the impacts of, of doing that. In order to further assist with customers, we made sure that we created a tool online where customers could uh, go and take a look at the rate analysis, dive in a little bit deeper, learn more about the rate uh, so they can get a better comfort level and understanding of what their rate options were. And we did that in 2016. Next slide. So initially the rate analysis tool that we had was had the rates calculated by our SC staff and we learned quickly that it was very labor intensive and it was uh, not the tool wasn't getting updated as much as we would like so we would only be able to update uh, the information semi-annually and customers uh, quickly started to complain that the data was not up to date and accurate. Um, so there was, and also we, at that time, we were only able to model a limited set of, of customers. So a lot of folks were complaining that they didn't have access to the tool and they wanted access. So what we did was we leveraged uh, the GridX rate engine and uh, there were a lot of benefits to doing that. Um, the first was we had uh, we had more accurate, timely rates, so they were more up to date rate information, and then it was scalable too. We were able to expand not just kind of the core, uh, what I would call like vanilla uh, customers. We were able to ex expand beyond that, so customers who had less than 12 months of data, or customers who were on a net energy metering rate we started to expand further and further out as we were able to to get more customers the information that they needed. Uh, we're also able to do what if scenarios and do take a look at things at an individual level as well as a batch level uh, to understand how customers might be impacted. So some of the key learnings uh, that we found, uh, one was uh, that onboarding a vendor took a, lo a little bit longer than expected, especially when you think about data that needs to go. It's not just a one-way data feed. Uh, GridX needs to have information about our customers as well. So there's a two-way data feed that's happening on a regular basis. Obviously there's cybersecurity, uh, you know, things that need to get ironed out during that time. Um, and that the second learning that we had was that the in internal staff were still needed to support changes to the tool, um, especially initially making sure we were doing validations and getting a comfort level of the calculations that we were seeing. Um, in addition, our rates change, right? So uh, we're constantly making changes. We're needing to make updates for various different campaigns going on. So there's a constant need still to have someone who's thinking about the experience for the tool. Um, you know, I'll give you one example we had uh, during COVID, we actually had a ban we placed a banner onto the page that said, you know, this information may not, it's historical, it may not reflect your current situation if you're now working from home. And then at some point we have to take that banner down. So it's no, you know, no longer becomes no longer relevant. So there's a constant need to make sure that the information is relevant to the customer and providing the value that they need so they can understand the information that they see. Next slide. 
So as regarding key findings for success to self-serve, uh, we did do uh, quite a bit of surveys with our customers. Um, we did both, uh, we did some qualitative concept tests, and then we also did a quantitative test with our residential customers to understand what was most important to them. Uh, the, the biggest thing I can say is uh, sometimes less is more, <laughs> especially like there's if you could have uh, customers who do want to learn more, like have them go to a place where they can learn more about it. That, that's good. But the initial screen, what we found were customers wanted to see annual cost. Um, at some points, we did experiments of like, do they want to see monthly information? We learned that most customers don't. They want they just want to see the bottom line. Am I going to save money on this or not? And then if they want to look at monthly information, make sure that you still have that, but it's not at the front and center because that's not what customers want to see. Uh, cost difference, so how much am I actually going to be saving um, compared to what rate I'm on? So help me do the math, right? So if it's going to cost me on my current rate, I'm spending $1,500 a year, and on this new rate, I'm spending only $1,100 a year, then what's my savings? $400, like help me you know, get to that conclusion that I'm looking for. Um, the third thing, make it clear that it's their cu the customer's actual usage, not a proxy. Uh, we continue to find that that's really important for customers, for them to know that this is my actual usage, so it's more relevant to me. Uh, customers also want to know if they're switching to the new rate, how long do I have to stay on the rate? For us, a lot of times uh, we require customers to stay on for 12 months. In the case of time of use, we did not do that because we wanted to give customers a comfort level to go uh, feel free to try out the rate. If they don't like it, they can maybe switch rates and, and allow them that flexibility. And then the final thing is what is the peak time? What is the time that I need to avoid uh, using my appliances. So they wanted to make sure that there was clear understanding of that. And a lot of the ways we did that was through actually the rate names. We call them the 4 to 9 p.m. rate, which means the peak is from 4 to 9. And then we had a 5 to 8 p.m. rate where the peak is 5 to 8 p.m. Um, we also had a third uh, rate on here that was called uh, T that's called TOU Prime, and that's our electrification rate. And that also has a peak from 4 to 9 p.m. Um, we continue to take a look at the tool. We're, we're constantly getting feedback from our customers. I always say that customers are our best gift, right? They, they love to tell us how to improve the tool. Uh, and so we're constantly looking at uh, comments from our customers and uh, trying to find ways to make things better for them. Next slide. So one of the other things I wanted to mention as part of the time of use transition was the, using the test and learn approach. So we leverage rate analyses to do that, and we started off by uh, reaching out and doing what we call like a time of use acquisition campaign um, with a smaller group of customers. We originally started with those who would benefit significantly um, by being on time of use rates. That offered us a lot of benefits. One was the ability to test with a smaller group before going full scale. Um, the other was providing customer satisfaction by letting folks know that they can save money. Um, and then the third reason was helping to fast track the transition for us. Uh, we knew, you know, at the time I mentioned earlier that we were replacing our billing system. So we had some constraints that we had to work around. And by having folks opt into those rates earlier, that was less people we had to uh, ultimately transition later. So it provided us with a lot of value by by doing this. We had several learnings when we went out to our customers. Uh, the first learning was provide communications in Spanish. Um, when we did, our take rate went up sizably. So what we did was, you know, front page is English, back page is Spanish, or vice versa, however you look at it. And that was that was very helpful for us, given that in Southern California, we do have a very high Spanish speaking population. So we found that to be very beneficial. Uh, the second thing we learned was uh, quality assurance process is needed to ensure accurate information on the communications. So we did do for all the, the communications went out. We also did press checks where we would uh, we would send the file to our printer and then we would actually go and review. Um, we would review samples. There were several times where we found things that were for whatever reason not correct with the file and that allowed us to make those changes quickly before we sent information out to customers that was incorrect. So that was very valuable for us as well. 
next, uh, low-income customers we found are more likely to enroll when given a business reply card. So we added that piece here. Um, on the flip side, we learned uh, once COVID had hit that uh, for uh, at least in California, mail delivery became much slower. So in some ways it was a plus um, when we did the actual transition because it allowed customers an easy way to respond back. That's still the top channel response of choice. Um, however, uh, we did find that it also became a curse for us because mail delivery was slow. And in some cases, we had customers returning these post business reply cards after they were already switched. So then we had to take a different process to move those customers back to the uh, their original rate. Uh, the final thing, keep it simple. Um, customers mentioned, uh, and I mentioned this earlier, that they didn't find value from seeing like what their rates were in the summer and the winter. We wanted to originally let them know, hey, your rates will be higher in the summer and lower in the winter. That's part of the uh, you know, things with uh, a summer peaking uh, territory that we're in. So uh, we found that customers didn't find that information as valuable. They just want to know how much money am I going to save at the end? So uh, the final thing I'll say here is that um, the launch of the smaller opt-in campaigns that we did, I, I believe in retrospect was critical for us um, to the success of the larger effort because it helped us iron out a lot of these things that it, had we started off going large scale and not had these learnings, I think we would have had a significantly uh, poor, worse result. Um, so it's my belief that doing an opt-in campaign ahead of time was for time of use was important. Um, but I would also say that just doing opt-in campaigns are not in and of itself a solution if you really want to have a large shift in the way customers are thinking. Uh, you know, when we do these acquisition campaigns, depending on how targeted they are, uh, you know, when we were getting more up to speed on it, we were probably getting between four to eight percent take rate. And that's because a lot of folks just don't read, you know, they don't read their mail as much. So you may miss them unless you're doing a large amount of campaigns. And then that becomes costly. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, you know, I we found like after we did the default time of use transition that it it did not have a significant impact on uh, our customer satisfaction in, in meaning that there wasn't uh, a harm in customers being dissatisfied from this. If customers had concerns about, hey, I, why did I get moved to this rate? We would say we can remove you from the rate and put you back to your original rate. And that was, uh, that was appealing for our customers. So we didn't really have a lot of uh, customer complaints about moving them to the time of use rate. So in, in retrospect, I feel like the approach that we did was, was a really good one. Okay, next slide. So we conducted the transition um, and what we what we found and we discussed with customers ahead of time when we surveyed them, the beginning, the pre uh, the pre communications that we did um, with with GridX um, as sharing the rate analyses, we learned that uh, customers were like, you know, give me uh, give me the information about the change and what the rate impacts are and then tell me more about how to best utilize this after the fact. So we did what we were calling a nurture campaign. After customers were transitioned, we did a welcome letter welcoming, welcoming them to time of use rates. And we sent several campaigns throughout the uh, throughout the following year to provide them with information on how they can save money on their new time of use rate, reminding them when the peak periods are, et cetera. One of the things that we did, uh, we leveraged with Oracle, which was a offering called uh, Rate Coach, um, and that was using Oracle's behavior load shaping solution. And we did that. We did a pilot initially in 2021, and then we also utilized this for our larger rollout in 2022, and we're we're currently utilizing them as well in 2023. And uh, you you can see a sample on the side here, and it it helps to visually the email. These were emails that were sent to our customers who uh, mentioned to us that they prefer email communications, which is about I think a little over half of our uh, customers who move to time of use. Uh, the the benefit of this is there's some visuals that uh, customers can help see to better understand how to use their their usage, and uh, and we sent these emails on a weekly basis. 
from um, July to November, and we had very little unsubscribe rate. Um, we saw initially when we first sent out the um, the emails that we did get some questions from our customers of like, hey, what is this information? Uh, and then after that, I think customers became more comfortable with uh, with the fact that we were sending them a, a weekly email. And it, the emails had different messages um, on them depending on uh, you know what what was happening for the customers. So sometimes we were uh, sharing information about um, you know when they were using the most electricity as well as uh, their their costs. So we had various emails that we sent them so uh, so that the information was still uh, fresh and and timely for the customer. Next slide. Okay. Um, yeah, so Vanessa, I think you were gonna um, you were gonna cover this slide, I believe. So I'll pass it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Eva. Um, great summary of the uh, Rate Coach program. Um, I think the the intent of the nurture campaign, uh, first and foremost, was to make sure customers were comfortable with their new rate and they knew what was happening. Uh, but we also measured what the impact was to the load curve to see. If, uh, if these communications could not only help with customer satisfaction, but also uh, help with uh, SCE's ultimate goal, which was to get, their, to get their usage in the peak to reduce, right? So we did a randomized control trial with the, with the approximately 800 customers that were, 800,000 customers that were treated um, and measured them against the controls who were also on the same time of use rate, but did not receive the rate coach communications. And we um, were very uh, excited about the results. The, uh, we were able to save um, on average 0.7% uh, of peak. Um, that's really high considering it's a daily behavior change. Um, and our peak kilowatt hour savings uh, in, in your peak months, which I don't know if you guys remember, August and September of last year were really, really hot. Um, we had the heat waves, we had all sorts of grid issues and um, uh, you know, you, we all remember, I think, um, but we, we were, this program alone was able to um, save 1.44 megawatt hours with, with these 800,000 customers. So super impactful. Um, I think the, you know, the, the foresight that Eva and her team showed to, to know that customers would want some ongoing information about their TOU rate and how it was working for them um, uh, was, was really effective here. And I don't, you saw that, you saw the last slide, um, you hear, you hear uh, us talk about behavioral change and a lot of people think about social comparison, but this, this product entirely uses like personal gamification um, and customers are really responding well to that. So it's, uh, we're, we're excited to see the results here um, from last summer. And like Eva said, we're, we're doing it again this summer. So we're um, uh, hoping for a very similar impact or better and uh, happy to discuss any more of these results as we go into Q&A. All right, I'll hand it back to you, Eva. Great, thank you, Vanessa. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think if we could go to the next slide. So I wanted to share the end results of, of what we saw from our time of use transition. So, uh, so first thing I wanted to mention is TOU participation remains strong. We had very few uh, customers leave the time of use rate uh, once they were on that. Uh, so we had we still maintain a really good participation. Like I said, it's been about 60% on a time of use rate, and that participation level since the default is occurred has uh, stayed steady, even though, you know, since that point in time, it's been a little over a year, you know, there have been customers moving in and out of their homes. So what we saw was we did, uh, we did do load impact studies. We did find that uh, we saw a statistically significant uh, load shift that occurred for both our 4 to 9 and 5 p.m. peak rates. 4 to 9 p.m. I think was roughly about a little over 1%. Uh, load shift, and then for the 5 to 8 p.m. peak, because there's higher price differentials, that was a higher load shift. I want to say it was like 1.3, 1, 1.3, 1.5% load shift. Uh, and a lot of folks may think, well, that's not a lot. But if you think about it for, for over 2 million customers um, that we have, I think we have now like 2.5 million customers that are on these rates, that adds up. And it actually winds up being 
uh, for for last year, it was around it estimated 75 megawatts, which in the lineup that we have for demand response was equivalent to our third largest DR program, basically. So it's it adds up significantly um, when you when you look at the big picture. The other thing I want to mention too is that one of our fastest rates, um, growing rates that we have is called TUD Prime, and it's for customers with an electric vehicle, heat pump, um, water, space heater, or battery storage. Uh, the large majority of those customers are EV owners, and we really are seeing that EV transformation um, happening in Southern California. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of customers moving to electric vehicles. You're seeing a change in infrastructure. I feel like almost daily when I when I drive around, I'm seeing uh, charging stations everywhere, and and people are using them, right? Uh, no matter where they are, at every hour. <laughs> I still think about by my house. There's a charging station that I, I went to. At 11:30 at night, and and there were a ton of folks there, um, with, you know, charging their cars. So it's definitely something that, uh, you know, is is transforming um, the way we we look at things in Southern California. Uh, the final thing I'll mention is that our our rate plan comparison tool, um, which we call RPCT, the use continues to remain very high um, for this, even despite the fact that. We are no longer, uh, you know, doing a, a, a default migration of customers to time of use that ended, uh, you know, in the earlier part of 2022. You can see that 2022 had higher growth than the prior year, and 2023 is on track to uh, to beat that as well. Uh, we find that uh, we do send annual rate analyses to our customers, so we find that that does drive uh, volume. Uh, to the site uh, to take a look at the rates, and also summer does. <laughs> We're definitely seeing now that it's gotten hotter here in Southern California that we do see an uptake in the customers using that. They get a higher bill and they go, is this the best rate for me? Let me let me shop and take a look. So this was not, I, you know, I say all this because this was not a one one time thing and now it's not, doesn't really serve a purpose. This is something that customers now expect from us and they find very valuable. And they, like I said, continue to ask for more things that they want to see from the tool. So it's been, um, you know, really nice addition to our overall suite of offerings that we can share with customers to help them manage their their energy use. So I think that's the last slide, and I know I've been seeing questions popping up. I haven't had a chance to read them, but I'm I uh, I figure at this point, um, Rich, you'll you'll come back on and and uh, and and have some stuff to to share with us. And before you take over, Rich, can can we go back to Eva's slide that shows the communication? I will answer Lenore with that visual if if that's okay. One more. There we go. Um, so Lenore, you see, um, oh, there. <laughs> okay, so that top, <laughs> now you're just messing with me. Judy, are you doing that? Or is it <laughs> <laughs> I thought, there it is. Okay, stop. All right. Um, okay, so if you see the top part, Lenore, it says, um, great job, you spent $13 less on electricity. Um, that message is a personal gamification with week over week um, comparison of how how much the the household is using on peak versus off peak um the that message varies like eva said depending on how the customer is doing sometimes um it will be you know you used you used um more during on peak and your biggest day was tuesday think about what was happening on tuesday sometimes it's um you know we it, you know, think about how you're using because you had a lot of on peak usage. It's very, it's very data driven and personalized to the week over week comparison. Uh, and then there's also a monthly snapshot every every four weeks so that people can kind of get a gauge. I don't know if how much you guys think about your energy, but we all think about it a lot more than our than our general customer base, right? So they don't they they need these ongoing reminders, and it's it's been pro it's proving to be extremely helpful to to reduce. And to reduce the confusion from the customer, which I think is what SCE's customers have benefited the most from. So hopefully that answers, but Lenore, we can follow up with other snapshots if you want to see what those look like, but that's the personal gamification. Thanks, Vanessa. Mm -hmm. um, so Eva, right at the point in time that you started talking about the uh, 
the, the vendor onboarding and, and stuff. We had a question come in asking about how long did the onboarding of your vendors um, take. Both both Vanessa and uh, and uh, and Scott have chimed in already in, in the chat. And I think that there's room still for you to maybe add a little bit more as far as what what that felt like from your side. Yeah, um, I can I can definitely do that. Um, so uh, yeah, and I'm also seeing if I can look. Yeah, so <laughs> I think we originally had planned. So I see Scott said it was about nine months. Um, so I think we had originally planned it for to be a little bit. It, the reality was actually Scott. It was I think it wound up being thirteen or fourteen months, if I'm remembering correctly. And what we actually um, wound up having to do, I think the original plan was that it was going to be like a little less than nine months, and then it wound up, I think, being thir 13 months for the the main scope. And then I think we had some additional scope that went at a later point in time. So it was probably, I, I wanna say it was like roughly four months extra that it took from what we had planned. Um, so that, and then Oracle um, to, for that piece, uh, and I don't know, Vanessa, if you respond on this one, this was a different um, setup because we were already onboarded with Oracle for other facets. So adding this piece, since it was just another slice, um, I, I think it took us about, I want to say it was only about three months to get this up and yeah, loaded. Yeah, that's what, I had, that's what I had put in the answer. I think it was, it was three months because we had okay. to make sure we were aligned on the colors and the messaging and the selection and all right. of that, but it was, yeah, it, it was, it, it was about a 90 day process. Right. Right. Yeah. Yes. And that's the other thing I forgot to mention is that this did align with our colors on the website um, so that customers can understand that those, um, those orange colors are, you know, more of like the warning <laughs> danger zone yeah. colors of like to stay yeah. out of yeah um we're actually we're we're considering changing our colors in the future by the way um interestingly yeah. enough but that's what these are the colors that we've been using for the past few years to kind of indicate um time of use um yeah i mean really the hardest part with onboarding vendor i found is the data exchange um so if you that that that's a just in general like the cybersecurity aspects and the data exchange and once that's up and running making additional modifications is a lot easier um i think uh you know when, whenever you're starting out on something there's there's things that you have to determine about uh you know what uh, what rates are in scope, what, you know, what's basically, what what is your scope? And then sometimes, uh, you know, those vanilla things are easy. And then when you start to add on like, oh, well, how about this flavor of customer? Then it starts to get a little bit harder, right? And then you have to kind of make decisions of like, all right, what do we, what is the core that we need to get started? And then what are some of the things that can come, that can come later? Um, so, you know, you work on your 80% uh, first and then the 20% kind of come later. Thank you for that. So yeah, I think we have, if I can, sorry, Rich, maybe I'll just jump in. Uh, uh, we'd had some lessons learned as well with the process with the, uh, I think we, we uh, stick to a real strict accuracy SLA where we want to make sure before any rate comparisons are sent out that uh, GridX can match the billing results that come from the CIS at our utilities. And as Eva said, you can achieve for a lot of the customers, we could achieve that accuracy. And then for the difficult rate plan combinations and certain customers that have exemptions, those things can tend to lag on. So we've actually taken some of that learning to say, have maybe a two phase approach where you can start providing rate analysis for customers that are here early on and then have a later release for those. And I think uh, with our implementation, Eva, we kind of waited till we got through all the customers. And so some of them would have been ready earlier, but but we went through the whole process. So we maybe could have done that a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that, Scott. And that actually answered a question that I was going to ask that was submitted earlier as far as the fact that there are, you know, more than one flavor of customer out there, right? Between budget billings and bi-monthlies and all sorts of things out there that that different things, those different aspects can take different timelines in order to get. You know, dialed in, and so I think that was that was really helpful. Thank you. Um, yeah. So what, what, 
Go oh, yeah, I was going to one more thing I was going to say on budget billing. I think for our budget billing customers, we do show um, not what they're the actual amount that they're paying on their bill, but the true amount that they're um, that they're supposed, you know, theoretically supposed to be accumulating, like incurring basically. Um, so that and I don't think there's been a lot of uh, complaints that we've had from our customers around that. Uh, like I said, our customers are pretty vocal on suggestions for the tool. So we haven't really seen any issues with that form of presentation for our budget billing customers. And so Eva, we did have a, a, a an earlier submitted question that asked about what the what the peak what the price differential was on peak to off peak for in the in the summertime. You may have showed that earlier, but I just want to make sure that, that, that we answered that. Yeah. So the four to nine PM and the in the peak summertime, it's a little bit uh right now it's a little bit less than two to one. So I, I wanna say it's about um let's see, I might even have it. I might even have it up. So um, for our 4 to 9 p.m. rate currently, uh, it's about uh, the off-peak time is about half the cost of the, the peak time. So the on-peak time for summers for 4 to 9 is about 59 cents before um, we do any baseline credits. And then off-peak is, is a little bit um, less, is less than that. So it's less than half. Um, and then 5 to 8 is a much stronger differential. That's a little bit, um, that's a little bit more than half. Um, so there's there's definitely a stronger signal there and we do see that customers uh, tend to behave uh, differently while on those rates they tend to shift load more um, and also we we found recently they they tend to get more savings as a result i mean i guess that's intuitive you would think if you are shifting load that you're getting a benefit but we did uh, a study recently where we found that they actually are saving more on those rates it has started me to think as we start to, you know, think about what's what's next after this, right? We're, you know, looking towards, uh, you know, more dynamic rates and whatnot. But what what we're seeing is that, you know, a three hour, a five hour, and this came from our customers anyway. The reason why we did a five to eight p.m. was because, in focus groups, customers said five hours. I can't not be home for five hours, right? I come home from work at four and I go to bed at nine there's not much I can do to shift. But if you give me a three hour window, there's things that I can do ahead of time to make that change. And we did see that come to fruition. We saw that customers have been able, with that smaller window of time, they have been able to make a more impactful change as a as a result of that. So that's been a you know, really valuable finding. And it makes sense. Like you can maybe say, I'll hold off on this for three hours, but five hours is a little bit harder to hold off on things when that's the only time you may be home and awake. So makes it kind of makes sense. Oh, it makes absolute sense. Thank you for that. Um, what type of technology help do you think your, your customers are, are, are using? Are, they, are you getting any feedback relative to that, you know, that they it's changing how they think of their uh, smart thermostat or, or some other technology in the home. Yeah, so we've done, um, you know, throughout this effort, we have done uh, a, a few pilots with our customers. And, and what we see is when a customer has um, something where they can control, like that's automated, where they can control their load, that they get a bigger shift from that. So like the two examples I'll give, one is programmable thermostats. We did do a pilot. Um, with our uh, customers uh, many years ago, um, and it was, I think, for our opt-in pilot. And we saw that uh, instead of a load shift being, I you know, mentioned earlier about 1%, um, the load shift wound up being 5% for those customers, right? So it was a much, a much larger uh, size of shift that we got when there was technology that helped them to better manage their energy use. Um, the second thing I'll share is from an uh, electric vehicle perspective, uh, we had we've seen on our prime rates. Well, first off, on all of our TOU rates, there's a much larger shift that happens when a customer has an electric vehicle. So instead of that one percent rate, forget the exact number, but similar type of thing. Like on our four to nine and five to eight, 8 p.m. rate, I think we're getting something uh, like you know maybe like five six percent type load shift. And for our prime rate, we're actually seeing over 20 percent of the load shift happening. These are customers. The customers I know who are on the prime rate are very aware of the fact that they need to avoid charging from 4 to 9 p.m. and they stick to that um, and they're they're really leveraging that uh, that lower off-peak time. That's what the Prime offers is they are for a much lower off-peak time and then in exchange for that there's a 
a, a higher fixed charge that the customer gets of about $12 a month. But there, we definitely see that shift in behavior when customers have automated technology and then they can leverage that um, for, for uh, you know, to get better savings. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Vanessa, from Oracle standpoint, I mean, you know, that sounds like some pretty impressive results with SCE. Um, what types of things do you have to share maybe with some other customers that you're working with in this space? Uh, sure. Yeah, this uh, this need for time of use communications has uh, has shown up in multiple uh, other places besides Southern California Edison. Uh, EVIS program is our largest program, um, and uh, we're we're proud of the work that we've done with them. But we're also uh, we were asked by Arizona Public Service to do a very similar uh, program uh, for a different reason. They they were having trouble with um, maybe customer perception of their TOU rates, and uh, they aren't and they aren't a, a mandatory TOU rate, but they are. Um, but they, but they are, you know, they have the largest TOU participation in, in the country outside of the mandatory requirements. So we are working with APS, um, and, uh, the, the communications did the job. They had a 16% increase in customer satisfaction on their JD power um, questions around managing energy use, um, and, uh, awareness of rates. Uh, they also are seeing a similar uh, benefit to their load shape, which helps their grid their grid side. Um, so, so yeah, so that is a that's been good. Um, you you all are probably familiar with um, uh, Smud's TOD rate. We do behavioral load shaping with them. We tested it with their um, low and moderate income folks to see if that would have a better impact for them, um, and uh, that was very effective. They just added more customers. To, to rate coach with them and um, a, a SCE's uh, counterpart in California with uh, Pacific Gas and Electric added behavioral load shaping um, this year. So we don't have those results yet, but we are we're definitely seeing it. And then to move away from the, the West Coast, uh, Evergy is doing a lot with behavioral load shaping, dynamic rates, rates engagement, uh, they started similarly to the way Eva started with small opt-in pilots, tested a lot of this with us, helped people get on the right rate, and now they are moving to uh, full territory mandatory TOU, and we are uh, we are working with them on that. So some examples. <laughs> nope, thank you for that. Appreciate it. Of course. Um, so uh, we we do have a question coming in asking about you know the customers who have. Uh, you know, didn't want email communication, you know, maybe, you know, signed up through response card, didn't want to go through email. Uh, how are they getting feedback and what and what frequency? Yeah, great question. Um, in, in addition, um, as I mentioned, we had uh, a lot of uh, direct mail pieces that went to customers who preferred direct mail. So we had a seasonal newsletter that got sent out twice a month to our customers and other uh, direct mail information. Um, at the end of the year, uh, we also did a, a kind of like, how did you do type of letter? Cause we offered customers bill protection. So we all also provided, um, we provided direct mail communications throughout the campaign of the like, welcome to time of use and then providing seasonal newsletters depending on um, you know what this what the season was, and then the kind of the closure of that of at the end of the year of like how did you do on this time of use rate? So they were in a, in addition to what we did with um, with the Oracle effort, we had uh, several campaigns throughout there, and then like I mentioned earlier, we do the annual rate comparison that has the GridX information. Um, incorporated into it for our annual rate comparisons that customers continue, all customers continue to receive in the channel of their choice. Thank you for that. Um, another question came in, um, I'm going to read it kind of verbatim and then maybe rephrase just slightly, is, um, is does the rate comparison tool calculate what impact would be if a customer shifted? For example, you used three kilowatt from four to nine um, last August. But if you pre-cooled and shifted to, to, you know, 20% of it earlier or later, you could save, you know, X amount. Were, were those types of examples of coaching given? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we had, 
so we offer that today for customers, but not from a self-service perspective. And that is something that we've been investigating because we are seeing that customers are requesting that. Um, you know, some of the common questions that we get, we don't get so much the uh, the prequel questions. The biggest questions that we're getting from our customers are, I'm thinking of buying an electric vehicle. If I do that, what will my bill be like and what's the best rate for me? I'm thinking about getting solar. What if I do that, you know, what would my bill impact be and what's the best rate for me, et cetera. So the big, we're seeing the big ticket items mainly of electric vehicle and then uh, solar as the, as the most common questions of what, what we're getting. But um, the tool does uh, have that capability for our reps to see as well as internally for us to do. And then Scott, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add as well. You're and you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you, uh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, we, we see the same thing. We're hearing more and more that um, certainly rate comparisons are helpful, but customers also want to know answers to to what if questions. So what if um, certainly, as Eva mentioned, things behind the meter, if we invest in resources behind the meter and increasingly, particularly, you know, certainly California is leading this, but customers are wanting to know not just about a single um, behind the meter resource, but they might have an EV and now they're thinking about solar or they're thinking about a heat pump in addition to their EV or all kinds of these things. So. We were also really focusing on doing those um, more, uh, hopefully not to come make it easier, but can be complex scenarios for customers to understand. So yes, as you said, certainly a capability and then uh, moving that to self-service is uh, potentially the next step. Yeah, and, and I, I want to say like, you know, when we think about, I know I showed initially a slide um, about, you know, clean energy future and where we're, we're moving towards, and we do see the future is more electrification. So we think that, you know, from a long-term perspective, we are going to get more and more of those questions. It's not going to, those questions aren't going to go away, right? We're going to continue to see uh, folks moving to electric vehicles and, uh, you know, changing out their heat pumps and getting, uh, you know, battery storage and all of those things will, you know, change how they how they use energy and interact with energy, and it becomes a larger component of, uh, you know, you know of what what their their lives are basically. So it becomes a little bit more, more more significant to them. You know, if you think about like our, you know, our phones initially way back when, like only you only really talked on your phone. Now you do everything on your phone, so like it becomes a larger part of your life and and we think that that's that's going to have some staying power for the long term thanks for that the um so vanessa i think maybe back back to you um i think you know you know there's economists out there that think that just changing prices is enough right so why would the yeah. utility need to do this rate coach stuff uh, well, I, you know, Brattle did a huge study on on this, um, where you know the, the time of use, the economics of time of use would make sense, right? You, why would you choose to spend money when your when your rate is fifty? What do you say, fifty nine cents, Eva, as opposed mm -hmm. to as opposed to half of that? Um, but I think we all know, or we should know, that you know humans don't behave logically. We just don't, right? Especially if you're running a household. I don't know about you all, but I'm really aware in my household of RTOU times. There are other people in my household who are not, um, and uh, you know need need ongoing reminders, and uh, it you know causes some family discussions. But but yeah, people people are living their lives. They're not thinking day to day about their energy use, much less you know a, 50, a thirty cents more you know to run the laundry or whatever. So. Uh, we we need extra we need extra reminders we need extra um, uh, technologies on top of the 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 rate to keep it top of mind for people and to see the behavioral change. Um, we there are multiple technologies out there. You know there are obviously device controls that you can program appropriately, so that helps get better results on a TOU rate. But what what the approach we've taken is. Um, is this gamification and this um, top of mind reminders to make sure that people are educated and just seeing it in real time, basically, right? Like week over week, we we need to do better or we're doing great. And uh, it uh, that just that extra nudge is uh, is really making these uh, these TOU rates more effective. 
-hmm. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. so yeah. You, you, and, and Jan, how did you guess it was teenagers? Weird. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yeah, we, I, I'll just add, uh, Rich, you know, we really think this is uh, for, for for many utilities and, and stakeholders that are considering time of use rates, the, the course get nervous about the on peak rates and the ability to, for those to raise customers bills and that it's probably appropriate to worry about this. But I also think this is for utilities out there who are having a lot of pressure around affordability of their bills and things like this, a real opportunity to engage with those customers that are struggling to say, on peak hours are four hours a day or five hours a day. The other 20 or 19 or 21 hours of the day, prices are likely to be lower than a standard rate. So these are really an opportunity to help uh, educate customers about their ability to have more control over their bill by taking control of their energy use. And yes, I agree with Vanessa, not everybody in the house may, may get the message, but it, it certainly is an opportunity, I think, for the utilities to help customers in a way that they can't on a more standard rate. I think that's one of the real advantages of a time of use rate is that to the extent you can engage with your customers, you can help them manage their bills better. Thank yeah, you. and the the other thing I, I wanted to share too that we found, you know, when we were surveying, because we did survey our customers throughout the transition and at the end of the transition, and we do see that, uh, you know, like kind of Vanessa was saying, life happens, right? People, people forget they they move on, right? In in a lot of cases, so we did see that after we stopped reminding customers about time of use, like we did see, uh, you know, a, a little bit of a drop in uh, things like awareness and and. And you know, we still we still saw really good results, but we we did see a drop when we're not, you know, sharing this information with customers and 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 you know, keeping it top of mind. Yeah, and, and I will say to to tie that back in with what I was answering for Rich earlier, um, the, all of our other customers that we're doing rate coach with, we are doing it year round because they, for different reasons, right? They have different time of use periods in the winter versus what they have in the summer. Um, or they've seen that boomerang effect that you're talking about, Eva, where if we don't remind them, they just move on with their life and they forget. So this is a, uh, it, it's surprising to us because we think about this all the time, right? But I think we need to remember that, you know, people have a lot of things they're juggling. This is this absolutely not top of mind unless we keep reminding them, mm -hmm. so. So Eva, just one last question here is you've touched a couple of different times about, you know, future thoughts and plans around, you know, time differentiated rates there um, at SCE. What 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 do you want what more do you want to share relative to your roadmap going forward? Yes, um, I want to I wanted to answer that. I did also see can, Rich. Can I, I I saw a question in the chat about the opt out rate. Can I cover that first and then talk about future yes. plans? Great. OK, so opt out rate. So when we did our pilot, the opt out rate was uh, was about uh, the the default pilot opt out rate. I can't remember the exact number, but I want to say it was like maybe on the side of 13 percent. When we did the full rollout, it was a little bit higher. Um, and part of the the two things that we heard were we did keep in mind that uh, we did this during COVID. It, higher meaning it was a, it was around uh, like the 20 25 percent range. Um, and it, it was higher for two reasons. One was we did this during COVID time period, uh, or, or, you know, in the midst of COVID. And so a lot of folks, when they were taking a look at their usage, they said that wasn't exactly the usage that I have now. So I'm, I'm not sure if that really applies. So I think that was one blip that we saw. The other thing that we saw um, was customers when they looked because our rates are revenue neutral, they looked and, and they saw what savings they would get and they said, okay, I'm going to save about um, $20 a year on this rate. It's it's not it's not worth that savings. And so we did have a few comments come through with that. So I just I wanted to to share that you know that if you have um, you know this gets back to I think Vanessa what you were saying earlier of like pe people have a lot of stuff going on. If you can save twenty bucks, our low income folks find that valuable. But maybe someone who's not low income doesn't twenty bucks doesn't matter to them. Like I spend that in gas driving to the store <laughs> so in California. So like, it's not a lot of money, you know, when you think about it. Um, 
Okay, final question on what's the future look like? Great question, um, because there is there is a lot of activity going on for us um, in the future, because now that we've gotten a time of use rate in place, we're thinking, uh, you know, how can we continue to uh, take a look at the duck curve that we have in California and find ways to, to mitigate the belly of the duck? And one of the things that we're looking at is uh, a, a dynamic pricing rate or like a real-time pricing rate. And that's something that's part of a new proceeding that's opened up in California where we're taking a look at uh, what we can uh, do to uh, encourage the use of market uh, based pricing with our customers. We actually have a pilot going at SCE that uh, we we have customers who uh, have just recently started billing on. Uh, both residential and non-residential customers are receiving a market-based um, pricing rate. So right now the volumes are small and we're just piloting this because we're just trying to learn. Um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier the test and learn approach and that's really valuable for us. And so that's, this is what we're focused on now is taking a look at that, um, we call it our flexible rate, uh, fle flexible pricing rate pilot, and seeing what, uh, you know, how our customers behave on that, and if we can get some benefits for uh, better load shift if we're sharing market prices. So I'm, I'm really excited about uh, the that uh, pilot that we're doing. It's running through, I think, through the end of 2024, um, and we hope to have, uh, you know, midterm results coming up, um, you know, uh, I think towards the end of this year, and then we'll have, uh, you know, more results that we'll be sharing, I think, in the early part of 2025, and hopefully those results can help shape a larger offering that we can provide to our customers. And that's it. Thank you for Thank that. You. I will hand it back to Judy. Thank you so much, Rich, and thank you, Eva and Vanessa and Scott, for an outstanding presentation today. Very, very interesting. So much to digest there. So really appreciate it. And congratulations again on your 20th PLMA award for this program. And uh, as we just wrap up here, I want to let everybody know that, in fact, this presentation, you can see it again. It will be on our YouTube channel. It will also be on our podcast this is the YouTube channel, and you can see at the top, you can find it at www.youtube.com slash at PLMA DR, DR for demand response. And of course, the podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts. Let's go to the next slide, please. Quick reminder, next week we will all be in Detroit, Michigan uh, for PLMA's very first EV symposium on managed charging. We're really excited about this first event. We have folks joining us from the automobile OEMs. We have folks joining us from uh, the EV side of several utilities. And of course, we are delighted to continue to uh, have people join us for that in Detroit. So if you would like to come, please go to peakload.org slash calendar and you are welcome to sign up. And next slide, please. Also want to let everybody know that PLMA, PLMA's uh, demand response training series, our evolution class, which is really our foundational class, is uh, going to be run again on September 12th and 13th. It will be live online, which is a very interactive format, and you get lots of great time with uh, instructors and mentors and uh, really enjoyable opportunities. So if you need a refresher or if you're new to um, DR, please come and join us for that. And now, now, last of all, as we wrap up for today and thank everybody for joining us, I'll let everybody know once more that you've been listening to a load management dialogue presented by PLMA. And to learn more about upcoming dialogues or an arch archive of past recordings, please visit us online at peakload.org. And this concludes this edition. Thank you, everybody, and have a great rest of the day.